four, three, two, one. Welcome back to the second half of the Grand Prairie City Council meeting for Monday, August 10th, 2020. Uh, we're here to hear from some scheduled delegations. Uh, we have one on our agenda. Uh, and my understanding is that there were some others uh, who also uh, submitted their request to speak. And so maybe I'll just look to Arlene. Uh, we have a delegation from Elcan Environmental Engineering. And then I think there were some additional ones, Arlene. Could you let us know who those were? Thank you, Mayor Given. We also have Randy Sims. He will present second. Um, he's here to discuss a naturalization um, within the city. And we also have Allison Bruce, who will present third. And she's here to discuss uh, parking space. Or park, I'm sorry, my apologies, park space. Park space, OK. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, three delegations that uh, submitted uh, notice uh, via the city's online form uh, that they wish to present this evening. So we'll start at the start with the first one that is on our printed delegation or so on our printed agenda, uh, and that is uh, representatives from Elkan uh, Environmental Engineering. Uh, if you're there, we'd ask you to turn on your camera and microphone, and that's sort of our invitation up to the council table. There we go. And uh, we'll invite you to make your presentation. Um, it looks like you may be in the same space. And so please, uh, I think maybe only one microphone on one device um, at a time so we don't get feedback. We'll give you about five minutes for your presentation and then uh, we'll have some time for council to ask any questions if they have any. Welcome. Uh, and if you could just introduce both yourselves. We have some breaking up. We're loading our presentation, so. Uh, okay, can you see our presentation? Uh, not yet, but you could uh, take the opportunity to introduce yourselves to council and to the, to the people who are watching the recording. I'm uh, Kent Santo, and I'm with Ron DeHuco. Kent, Rhonda, welcome. Can you hear us? Absolutely. Can you see us? Okay. Okay, right. We'd, we'd like to welcome, um, uh, introduce Kent. Uh, you'll see, can you see our presentation yet? No, not yet. Uh, so I'll, maybe I'll just ask Director Bork. Uh, I'm wondering if you can see. Your screen. Uh, it should be no issue for them to share, although I do have an advanced copy I can share on their behalf if that would be. Are you seeing our presentation? Nope, here we go. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe that's it. Can you see it now? Okay, okay, sorry about that. Okay, we got it okay. now. Thank you very much. Okay, so I would just like to um, say our presentation today is on face masks for COVID-19 on all solutions from a safety and industrial hygiene perspective. Um, is that still shared, fine? Yes, okay. So uh, Kent is, uh, uh, you see his uh, credentials here. He's been industrial hygiene specialist for 40 years. And I'll draw you to the last line. He's been appointed for Occupational Health and Safety Advisory Council as an employee or representative to the prestigious Department of Alberta Labor and Immigration. And uh, I'm also here with the industrial hygiene experience. We're going to try and fly through. We've got a lot of information to present today. So basically, you have information um, <clears throat> on, uh, we're going to look at it from an uh, industrial hygiene um, perspective. Is that we're dealing with a hazard, and you guys understand um, the COVID, so we're not going to go over um, much of the information here. But oh, it's loading slow here. Okay. Okay, yeah. So you can see the particle size. So just in case anybody doesn't have an issue with um, understanding the particle size, my computer is um, reacting slowly with the mouse. So. Um, it's on my screen. <laughs> okay, so as we got. Two computers here. So as you can see how small the uh, particle is, one of the things we want to know from a hazard perspective, that's the hazard we're dealing with, that you're dealing with, making decisions. Well, it can piggyback on any of these things. For uh, These things are all inhalable. Things are bigger, would be ingested, so it can piggyback on that as well. So it, there's a, lots of issues that you have to control the hazard. And we go to the next uh, standard is, um, this is a standard on um, a Applying the hierarchy of controls, you may have seen this uh, if you've ever done any safety uh, work at any uh, organization. And elimination would be social distancing, 
substitution. We don't have a, uh, applicable engineering controls would be ventilate, uh, ventilation, applicable barriers, and you have administrating, uh, uh, administrative controls, um, you know, hand sanitizer, uh, working from home, which we're doing. So we do a lot of those things. And then you've got PPE. So the last line of protection on hazard control is PPE. Now, the big thing about PPE and those hazard controls is the fact that they have standards, okay? So we're going to go to, oh, went the wrong way here. <clears throat> okay, so typical standards in North America, you, you have You have NIOSH, we're having trouble with our computer, computer here, okay. We have internet connection is unstable, so we're having trouble here with the connection. Can you still hear me okay? Okay. So, with protection, you would have like PPE, personal protective equipment. The person would have a respirator fit test and be trained in its use plus its maintenance. And under the regulations and code of the country, unless you do that, uh, supplying anybody with a, a mask or respiratory would be um, a, a non-compliant. And part of the standards that are out there are the National Institute of Occupational Health and Safety, which would uh, have a standard here for this respirator. So I would have it has an actual standard, like stapled on it or printed on it, so you know that it's a standard. And then, and then I would have it fit tested. I can have this fit tested. And one of the big issues on a respirator is is that breakdown, right? So one of the things that you're right now is that. And you're, a lot of people are wearing bandanas or whatever kind of face detection, and it's got like this would be it. So basically, the system that we have or what you're proposing has got all kinds of holes in it because they're not being fit tested. There's been no maintenance, no training. So and the standard, this thing doesn't have a standard. At least air goes in least least line of resistance. If I have even if I have a respirator fit test, this is full of holes. I'm just giving you an example of what these things are basically full of holes. But this one right here, if I have it fit tested and if I don't have it fit tested and I have leaks when you breathe all your air coming in and out goes through the least line of resistance this is a a, a moldex which has a, a beveled um, filter on it to increase the actually that makes it easier to breathe we recommend this is the best n95 you, you can see another problem with the respirators and standards is also the ones that have a valve which don't aren't very good okay so we just missed one slide I'll just go back here so the whole premise for the respiratory protection is two things, one to remove particulates and one to prevent leaks, which you can't talk about. So we need to remove particulates that are approximately 0.1 microns for SARS. And most of these, all these filters, uh, respirators, face masks that are designed by standards are, don't remove that grain. So we're just going to flip to the next slide. Can't talk about this one. All right. So the, basically sending wear masks, you know, like wearing bandanas. If I go like this, that's, you know, a mask. There's no standards. If you don't have a standard, it basically it's free for all. And then what you're doing is you're giving people who have COVID walking out, wearing a mask that has no scientific standard um, that they're wearing, if they're wearing a bandana. And if they have the COVID, that means they're bringing it out in into the community under the impression that they're wearing a mask and it's going to help. On the same side, a person who is vulnerable, somebody in a senior home or somebody that's uh, vulnerable with a uh, compromised immune system, if you say wearing masks helps and generally speak that out there and, and endorse it, you're saying that this person is going to go out in the community with something that hasn't been, this hasn't been scientifically proven. This stuff has for small particulate, but with training and standards of respiratory fit testing and all this stuff. So the, the issue that we're having is that, yes, respiratory protection masks have some value, but without the 
training, without the maintenance, without the education and fit testing, they're basically full of holes and there's no standard. So is it really, it, it can cause other hazards. You give a false sense of security to people. And this would be a standard thing where I tell people I've dealt with asbestos, PCBs, mercury, arsenic, and asbestos is a prime example. It's something that would go into your lungs as small. And this, if you look at this standard, you can review it later on. I would be wearing a full um, uh, coveralls, um, disposable or washable. I'd have my full, full um, respirator with a P100 uh, respirator filters on it with the masks. I would have my hands and my wrists taped. I'd have my legs taped. And I have my, I'd have booties on that would be stuffed. So when I'm finished, I would be going and disposing all of that stuff into a bag, sealing it up, either getting it properly, um, professionally washed, or I uh, would be disposing of it. And then, and then I would go to a decontamination chamber afterwards to wash everything that off of me. So then I would go out and then I would be clean. That's the standard for asbestos. It is an equivalent size and, and actually less of the hazard than the coronavirus. If I had to go in and do a work, if I was working with the coronavirus, the level of protection is high to dealing with the hazard of this nature. And things that Ken describes would be what Alberta Occupational Health and Safety requires us to do for asbestos abatement today. And we've done that in Grand Prairie for lots of asbestos abatement jobs. These are the type of respirators that you would use, but again, training, fit, fit testing, and standards. All these things have standards that have been um, well documented. And this is what the example of what we're trying to give to you about what the standards are here. And as you can see, the deadliest virus in history, and we're wearing a mask that hasn't got a respirator fit test or standards, or we're wearing a bandana. And this is just a bit more on efficiencies of the N95 the size distribution, we're dealing with a particle size that's very small. I'd recommend a P100. If I was anywhere near and knew I was near um, a coronavirus, I would be using a P100 uh, filter, not any other mask. Why would I chance myself? So back to what we're saying, face masks are too varied in material and fit to be reliable for protection, no standard. Masks are the least protective measure when identifying controls against hazards. There's conflicting research on the pros and cons of face masks. If you can find a study, I've read studies, they say it may help, it might help. There's no definite stand. When I deal with asbestos or, and actually my, I've done biological monitoring for things like lead and arsenic. And <clears throat> we do urinary arsenic uh, samples for people who are exposed to arsenic and we do blood leads for people as opposed to lead. And even people in industries, I worked in lead industry and I worked with a uh, gold industry with uh, arsenic in it. And everybody who had all the training, all, all the respirators and um, coveralls and clean systems and education still under their biological monitoring got exposed wearing the top standard. We're gonna go to a low standard of face masks and bandanas with no standards, I can equate, extrapolate without any issues that people will be exposed using that low standard. If they believe it's protecting them and they put themselves in a vulnerable situation. We're not against having an advisory from city council. we advise that it may help, but to mandate it as a, a definite protection for somebody with uh, the potential of getting uh, the COVID-19 or somebody um, going out that has it and, and it prevents them from spreading it because they have a mask on, those would be, I, I would say, ill-advised uh, mandating those kind of situations. So if you want any additional further information, of course, we would love to answer any questions today, but also uh, you can follow up with you.
future uh, questions if you'd like. It's a lot of information. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, thank you both. Uh, appreciate the presentation. Uh, Council, any questions for the delegation? Councillor O'Toole. Yeah, I know uh, my past history as a safety officer as well, and I know all about the masks and the fit testing and all that. But uh, there's a number of people that doing their job are wearing face masks that are lenses in front of them, like a face shield, as well as the face mask. And uh, I know obviously you're not too keen on the face mask at this point in time, but uh, what are your thoughts on the face shield and the face mask? Well, it's an added protection of um, <clears throat> preventing the barrier, but it comes back to the least line of something that's floating in the air and the visor's protecting your, but again, you're breathing the air from here. And it, if you had a state, if the, somebody was to, um, let's say, cough in your direction, yes, it, it appears that the mask would stop the frontal to your mask but when you're breathing your breathing goes the least line of resistance so the air in, in the air is still coming around it's sucking around the mask and if there, there's a, a virus in the air or there's contaminants in the air they're still going then they're going to your mask again they're going least everything goes least line of resistance that's one of the things that's out there yeah I mean, we're, you know, we're just concerned that this this sorry go ahead Oh, I just uh, appreciate you guys showing up today and giving us your professional opinion. And uh, we'll uh, probably deal with this later today or maybe uh, sometime very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor. Okay. Okay. Questions for the delegation? Uh, looks like we don't have any additional ones, but thanks very much for taking the time and uh, reaching out to ensure that you had a chance to present to council. We appreciated hearing from you as we appreciate hearing from uh, anybody in our community and we'd like thank to make you. this available. Uh, thank you both for being here tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks. And we hope you will use this information to make a good decision. Thank you. Okay, so we have a couple of other delegations. Uh, I'll uh, in, invite you both uh, to turn off your cameras and microphones so we can invite up our next delegation. Um, and I think that was uh, Mr. Stim yeah. uh, with respect to uh, naturalization. This is a policy on naturalization of some uh, green areas. Uh, Randy, welcome. And we can Hi. see you there. I think we can hear you. Uh, you kind of heard the uh, routine with the other delegation. Uh, we'll invite you to uh, do about five minutes or so of presentation, then we'll give an opportunity for questions. Welcome. Awesome. Um, the next delegation is actually my neighbor right next to me about the same item, so I'll probably she has some technical difficulties with a microphone, so I might just speak for the both of us. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm not that prepared. Hello, good evening. My name is Randy Sims. I'm a resident of Mission Heights. I'm here to address the issue of my, uh, my neighbors and I are quite upset about. The open easement behind our home, there's uh, at the end of McHale's uh, Boulevard and 102nd Asian Street has yet to be maintained. And we all, my neighbors and I, began to investigate this probably mid-June-ish, talking with them. Myself, I started with using a C-click fix, thinking to follow my chain of command and find a way to uh, resolve it. There wasn't really an option to select something. There was only noxious weeds to select. So my first response back was it wasn't the outlet I was supposed to use. So I wasn't too sure where to go from there. So I used a city contact and I phoned once and they began to move it forward and I asked for a response back. Um, I didn't get one in about the middle of July, but a week and a half, two weeks later, I called again. Uh, this was the one I figured out that naturalization was happening throughout different parts of the city. It was something I wasn't too sure about. So I asked to hear from someone from parks or some supervisor to kind of enlighten me of why the area was selected and where I could go to delegate it. Obviously, I, I landed here after a few other steps. So I felt at a loss after my um, 
emails back. I got two emails back. I have them printed off. Obviously, I can't show you them. I uh, quoted a few things, but one of the things I was told is I was blessed to be joining the naturalization process in the two emails, and I wasn't too sure how to take it. In the last email, I was given the following points uh, why they were not being maintained, and there were fairly legit reasons there was, and uh, things I should be aware of. I was assured there would be no increase in rodents or mice, voles that are attracting uh, to food sources or garbage. Uh, no increase in mosquitoes as they breed in standing water, not in tall grass, and no added fire risk to the neighborhoods and the homes. In the last email, so we got the reasons the area had been naturalized were uh, steep slopes were dangerous for mowing and equipment was getting stuck due to saturation at the bottom of the area. And then I quoted this right out of the email. The area was not classified uh, as a neighborhood park, but rather a stormwater management system. It should have been naturalized from its inception, which certainly is believed the grass should be mowed, but only for purpose. It is too expensive a uh, uh, proposition to mow the area, not classified as a park or a sports field. And we have begun the process of naturalizing many similar areas across the city. Um, within that, there is an adjacent field right behind it and uh, it had been mowed several times this year which confused me as well because it also had slopes. Um, I was told it was an ecosystem and that mowing it would destroy, uh, would destroy it. And then I finally got the cost savings were $2,000 per hectare which I do understand um, the cost savings by mowing if it's not for purpose. A few of the other things that I came alerted to and I started to question a few of those. Um, the area isn't just the property behind my home or my neighbor's home, but we, were, we all had a discussion of, it wasn't just used by us, it was used by the, uh, the neighboring schools, Kateri Mission, and I believe uh, Derek Taylor for their tri days, their Toboggan Hill. And also uh, I've had a good foundation with Nighthawk ski area and I know they used to come in and bring children to the toboggan hill behind there and with the grass so tall the snow would not settle in the winter and it would be rendered useless. Um, a lot of gym activities are used back there and a lot of the neighboring neighbors not in our direct area do use it for their dog walking toboggans. I've had a ton of other parents and families back there. Moving on to being assured that the rodent problem wouldn't be an issue. I felt uh, a little absurd knowing that if I haven't maintained any length on my side of the fence, which I usually give, and along with all my neighbors, we maintain about at least 10 to 20 feet away from all our neighboring properties. So the mower didn't have to go as high. We just kind of meet the city in the halfway point there. So if we didn't ensure that I would have rodents directly into my yard, I got three dogs, two kids, and I don't want one of them eating a vole that's carrying some sort of virus. Uh, moving on to the mosquitoes, I, oh, after five o'clock when the sun starts to set, my backyard is now rendered useless. I can't bring my kids or dogs outside. Uh, I've had, and my one kid has uh, allergic reactions to the mosquito bites because he's so young, so he pops up like a balloon. So I'm pretty limited about 4.30 to five o'clock in the summers. Um, I brought up that it had been used by, uh, we use the legit traffic down there. I've talked about the kids down there, the Toboggan Hills, and also Nighthawk Ski Area as well. And I was told that with the growing canopy cover, uh, there, I kind of thought there would be a lot less illegitimate uh, traffic bound down there. Uh, home tents, we've had tents back there and a uh, neighboring brush, which I've called in and it's been taken care of, which it, it got taken care of very fast. But that growing concern of more and more back there at once the canopy cover is full, kind of raises more concerns with a little bit more unseen area. And then when it came to uh, the risk that the area was chosen not to be a fire risk, I, I had a hard time getting over it. I've lived in Grand Prairie my whole life and the wind has always come from the west always strong from the west. Right now it's coming strong from the west. And when the grass gets right now, I'm not too worried about because it's so green and so full and lush, but it's the fall 
in the spring when it addresses my concerns. At the top of the hill is my residence. As long as I've known wind, it's come from the west. And as long as I've known fire, it's gone up. At the top and downwind are a bunch of adjacent homes. And that was my uh, greatest concern. Uh, the way of preventing that would be a fire break. Uh, I'm familiar with fire smart programs around the region. And they always tell you to clean up your tall uh, brush, your deadfall and making fire breaks. Right now our fire break is eliminated. Um, the only fire break we have is the neighbors that have gone out and do cut on the other side of the property to give a leeway for the mower as is. Um, between my neighbors as a consensus, we were a little disappointed at, at uh, how far we had to go to discover the change that uh, we weren't really alerted about. And many were focused on just dealing with it and a lot of the emails and responses that my neighbors and I have received there were no phone calls, emails, public articles, knock on the door from a representative, not even a post-it note that we were aware that this was happening. We all had to go and kind of hunt it. And I do strongly believe that the communication gap was missed between the neighbors and uh, city there. Uh, now my neighbors have written to you addressing these concerns already. We fortunately had Councilor Bretzi come out in the neighborhood, which I, I thank you again, that was very positive. It's always nice to see a face come out and show a little bit of personality. He took the walk through the ravine, and I I respect you for that. That was a, thank you very much. He was made aware of some of the things, and he kind of gave us a couple of heads up things that we had to talk to you about and bring up. And ultimately speaking, with among the neighborhood, we would like to see this maintained again, maybe rezoned or utilized more positively. We've talked about. Um, maybe having it some sort of park space or looking at options. It's beautiful when it was mowed. How can we make it more beautiful to attract more positive uh, feedback from the neighborhood around us and attract more people to the area? Uh, it had been in Maintown. I found this out the other night when uh, Councillor came in. To the, that it, I guess it had been made for 10 years and the neighborhood and I are actually upset that it had been halted. I hope there's a way the city and the neighborhood can reach some sort of resolution to this. And I wish I made a PowerPoint presentation because I think I could have made a very good one. No, uh, thanks very much, Randy. Uh, that was a great presentation. And, uh, you know, we don't always, it can be helpful when there's stuff to show us a picture or whatever, but I think uh, everybody's familiar with the area you're talking about and you related your concerns fine. Uh, uh, totally. Uh, any questions for the delegation? Any questions for Mr. Sims? Uh, Councilor Bressy. Hey, thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. Sims, for coming in or joining our meeting. Appreciate you sharing with every with everybody your thoughts and concerns, and really appreciated your neighbors sharing some with me as well. I was curious. I know something I asked so I asked your neighbors, but I, I, my apologies, I can't recall if I asked you this or not. It is quite a big area, and there's. It seems to me that there's a big difference between the north end of the ravine that's right behind your homes and backs right onto the yards and the, su the southern side of the southern end of the ravine where you can't see as many homes and I don't know if as much traffic through it is there as possible is I'm just kind of curious uh, you're asking for the city to go back to maintaining it but what's your view in terms of does the whole thing have to be maintained the way it was in past years or are you just hoping part of it gets maintained or just tell me a little bit about exactly how much you're hoping gets done in the future. Talking with the neighbors when everyone kind of enters in, I guess, our part of the neighborhood, it, I bring up the unsightly thing. And I know it's, it's just a hard ask for $2,000 a hectare to do the entire thing. Uh, talking with my neighbors, we, we wanted some sort of resolution. We knew the Toboggan Hill was a big feature point and maybe the entrance in to have that part maintained. It's sightly to come in. It, it's, it's a lot to ask for, but the Toboggan Hill and a lot of the open space to walk down through the bottom would be a little bit resolved. We wanted to, we don't want to wreck equipment. We're kind of looking to meet halfway and have as much looked after as possible. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Mr. Sims. Uh, any other questions for the delegation? Now, I'll just uh, note, uh, you know, we're all trying to figure out uh, new, new technology and how to use it. Um, uh, I see that uh, Ms. Bruce sent a, a message on the chat function. 
I'm not sure that that's actually recorded in our webcast. Uh, so Allison, uh, I'm gonna um, relate what you put there. Uh, it was sent in the text or in the chat uh, function. Uh, we're gonna try to avoid using that because uh, we are recording the meetings, uh, saving them to the website and broadcasting them so people can see it. But uh, Ms. Bruce wrote, the whole area is used as a throughway at the far end, there's a big toboggan hill that's regular, regularly accessed. So I uh, appreciate that contribution. Just wanted to make sure that uh, you know that we saw that, Ms. Bruce. But if we can, uh, and I will come to you, even if you can only do audio, that's fine. Uh, uh, but we'll, we'll come to you after Mr. Sims is done. Um, anything else? Uh, any other questions for Mr. Sims, Councillor Frieden? Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, thank you, Mr. Sims, for coming in and uh, and for Ms. Bruce on, on as well. Um, this can well be, I especially um, connected when you talked about mosquitoes, like I don't as much care what it looks like, but please to goodness <laughs> don't increase mosquitoes in my yard. Um, so I, I can appreciate that. And, and um, I know that probably the, uh, I'd actually just moved out of Mission Heights last year and had all of a sudden a, a part of the, you know, city property that had always been mowed, not been mowed anymore, that would be a huge concern. So I, I get it. Um, I'm just wondering, so one of the reasons why uh, we changed mowing in, in many of our areas, um, there were a few changes. We, we went to less frequent mowing in some areas and um, selecting areas that made sense to naturalize to let them do that. And uh, the, one of the major pushes, there, there were a couple. Um, I am a fan of naturalization where it makes sense. And, um, but, but I think the greater push was understanding how we might be able to um, alleviate the burden of cost on residents of Grand Prairie. So when our rationale and our request to administration was put forward to reduce mulling and allow some areas to naturalize, um, it made sense to look at areas all across the city to do that. So a number of areas have are undergoing that process now. So my question is, in the event that, um, you know, we decided to come back and, and start mowing part or all of that area, um, because it makes sense in, in the big picture of how we applied um, the, the um, measures to determine the different areas that we would allow naturalized in the city, because it made sense in, in that way. Um, and instead of, you know, changing the rules for one community that has concerns, um, there are some, there, there's one other instance in the city where community has a, 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 um, at their request, uh, something that costs the city a little more and because it is in a single community, they actually pay uh, a little more to have that there. And so my question is, do, what do you think about that idea that if one community is saying, whoa, you know, we really don't want this naturalized area, but we've applied the same rules across the city to naturalized areas, what do you think about the idea of potentially having a, a little extra added to your tax bill um, to ensure that we continue mowing that area? Because that was one of the major drivers in the decision. Can you speak to that maybe? I can't speak for all my neighbors, mm -hmm. but I knew that we, I did just about double my taxes to move to this area because of it. It's a little hurtful to go that route since I invested so much to come here and it's a it, it would be I don't it, it would be a no for me but I'm looking from maybe a halfway point I know uh, there is some suggestions that you know Councilor Bressy brought up and we did discuss this that there there is a medium here I, I can't speak for all my neighbors but I know a lot of my neighbors would probably be leaning towards the no because we've had the raise, but we've already had it maintained for so long. And I think that's uh, my direct neighbor to the left of me. It was what he was uh, brought up. But we did discuss that, absolutely. We knew that there was going to be some sort of medium that we'd have to talk about. 
Right. Thank you. That, uh, that yeah, that's um, a perfectly reasonable response. And <laughs> I, I hope that we can come to that sort of happy medium. But I really do um, um, feel for this sudden change that came as a surprise to you. Um, thank you very much again for coming today. Well, thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Sims? No. Uh, so, uh, Randy, it uh, looks like we don't have any additional questions. Thanks very much for your presentation this evening. Appreciate you uh, working with us through this new medium um, and really appreciate you taking the time to bring your concern to council. Um, we create these opportunities. We have these delegation portions of our agenda and very often we don't have people using them. So appreciate the fact that you oh. took the time to do that. Thank you. That's my first time. So I was a little nervous. <laughs> well, you did, you did totally fine. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You pulled it off good. <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll invite, invite you to turn off your camera and mute your microphone. You're more than welcome to stick around if you want to listen to the rest of the meeting. Um, so, Ms. Bruce, uh, um, you uh, uh, said that you may be having some difficulty with your video. Would you like to give a try uh, to participating just with audio? That's completely fine. We don't need necessarily to see you. If you'd like to try just audio, we can give that a try. Or if technology isn't working for you this time around, uh, we would be happy to have you at a future council meeting. And then, um, and Allison has sent me a message and saying that she, she is, uh, sounds like a technology issue that uh, failed to detect the microphone. So it sounds like maybe a technology issue on, on your end, Allison. Um, we would be happy to have you uh, call in alternately using just a telephone is also possible. Um, and I could share that telephone number if you'd like to try that. Um, because when I do give that opportunity, um, I'll just share this. Uh, well, it's actually pretty long. <laughs> so I'm not sure if that'll be, if that'll be ideal. But if, if you're in a position uh, to be able to write this down, uh, the dial-in number would be uh, 1-587-3281-099. Uh, and then you will be asked for the conference code. Actually, you know what? Sorry, everybody. Um, I, as I was just saying before about not using the chat function, I sent a direct message uh, to Ms. Bruce to give her the link to the telephone number um, and also the code that she would need to enter uh, when it comes to it. Um, Ms. Bruce, maybe just in the chat, can you let me know if you received that and if that will work for you? Or, as I said, we are more than happy to hear from you again next week. We appreciate that your concern was uh, similar to Mr. Sims, um, but we want to make sure that you've had an opportunity to uh, share or present to council. Bruce, I'm going to give you another uh, minute to uh, reply back that you've received the telephone number. Appreciate if you're dialing and maybe difficult to dial in text. And again, uh, we'd be happy to have you come back to a future council meeting. Um, uh, Ms. Bruce just uh, sent a message saying that she would attend next meeting. So uh, our apologies, Allison, that this didn't work out, uh, <laughs> uh, that this didn't work out for you this time around. Uh, we'll make sure that uh, you have another opportunity to present and uh, we are happy to have you at any council meeting. And, and uh, you know, we're all dealing in the world of trying to put in this new technology and allow public participation as much as possible. Appreciate you're willing to attend. 
appreciate that you're willing to come back and attend at a future meeting and we will always be happy to have you. So um, thanks for sticking with us through this and uh, I'm sorry that didn't work out tonight, um, but we'll have you back for a future council meeting. So we'll ask uh, Arlene and our city clerk's department to follow up with you to make those arrangements so that you can participate next time. Thanks very much, Allison. Okay, now that you've all got half of that one-sided conversation, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's all of our delegations for this evening. Um, and so we'll move on to business arising. I would just remind council that uh, we did have the letter from the uh, United Nurses of Alberta earlier. Uh, I believe we received that for information at that stage. And then we had our two delegations uh, this afternoon, different issues, uh, the presentation from Elcan Engineering and then the presentation from Mr. Sims. So I would look for uh, motions or anything dealing with uh, those two delegations. Um, Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you, thank you, Mary Given. I think that there's two. Um, I want. I'm gonna. I'm gonna try a motion. See what Council thinks, and I hope this motion passes. And I suspect that there will be some members that want to do a bit additional business after this. But I think it might be a good place to start. And. Uh, that is, and that is, I'd move that council direct administration to bring forward a public information campaign to inform residents about the appropriate use of face coverings to prevent the spread of disease and encourage the voluntary use of face coverings in indoor public spaces. I want to thank Mayor Given for help, helping craft that and helping talk through that, through that idea a little bit. And kind of thinking about this is we're going to have to talk about mandatory masks at some point and I'm not saying we're gonna have to institute them but we have to have that conversation at some point just where this conversation is going but I'd assume that all of council would agree that a mandatory mask isn't something we want and that's kind of a last resort if masks are needed then we'd sure love to have our residents voluntarily do it first I think that, that that's a good response to give to the nurses if we if we don't end up instituting mandatory masks uh, we're considering that but we are talking about voluntary measures I'd also note that our second delegation, which was against mandatory masks, one of the reasons was pointed out fairly enough that there are some issues with the proper use of masks. And I've heard that from Dr. Hinshaw repeatedly too, how important it is to wash your hands, how important it is to properly store a mask, how important it is to use them properly if you use them in public. And I think more can be done locally, both to hopefully get more people with voluntarily using masks and also doing it properly. So I hope that council will support this motion, even recognizing there's probably some that want to do more than this as well. Okay, hey, thanks Councillor Bressy. So obviously dealing with the uh, two uh, mask or face covering related delegations. Uh, that motion's obviously in order. Um, direction to administration on uh, public, uh, public education, uh, essentially. Uh, any discussion or debate on that motion? Uh, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mayor Gavin. Um, I, I'm not opposed to this concept. Um, something that can be done relatively quickly, I would think. Um, I, would just make, I would just make the point that um, we still need to look at the, uh, uh, the need for a mandatory masking policy. And so I would, I would support this provided that uh, it's not the only thing that we do. Uh, thanks, Councilor Blackburn. Well, sure, uh, obviously, uh, this is Councilor Bressy's motion. Any other council member could make any other motion, um, as long as it's, I suppose, not contradictory to the one that, uh, you know, the, with how we land on this one. Um, but certainly, if there's, if this one, if it's, however this one is dealt with by council, uh, additional motions can follow, for sure. Um, any other uh, discussion on Councilor Bressy's motion? Councilor O'Toole, then Councilor Thiessen, then Councilor Plot. I uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. I do, uh, I like what Mr. Bressy has got to say. I also want to just add on uh, social distancing and respect for others and the washing of hands is very important. Uh, I do agree that the masks aren't 100%, absolutely. I totally understand that, but it's a, it's a start. And uh, I don't want to be the, the person that... Uh, says no to masks or I don't want to be the person that says yes to masks. I want to do scientific evidence. I want to get the, uh, the go ahead from the province on what, uh, what we would uh, be expected to do. And we're not getting that from the province. So it's a decision that the city is going to have to make at some time. 
hopefully we don't have to. But uh, I'd like to have the our administration definitely look into all the possibilities and making some kind of a bylaw. So thank you. Thanks, Councillor O'Toole, Councillor Thiessen, then Councillor Block. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor Given, and thank you, uh, Councillor Bresti, for bringing forward this motion. I do agree with you. Education is key. Uh, respect should always be encouraged, especially within uh, our community membership. Uh, and uh, we as a council and as an organization should be promoting this uh, steadfastly, ensuring that people uh, act first and foremost with kindness and uh, ensure that, uh, you know, whether or not their beliefs contradict those standing six meters or less with between them, that uh, there's that level of respect and uh, we all have a part to play in that. So uh, this is a first small step as far as uh, not making anything mandatory. I, I'm pretty sure I know where I land on that one, but at least encouraging people to be mindful of their distance uh, to be mindful of proper hygiene and to do the things that we've done that's kept our numbers so low. So hopefully we don't ever have to mandate uh, a mask wearing policy. So for all those reasons, I'll support and thank you for bringing that up. Thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Councillor Plott, then Councillor Friesen. Uh, thanks, Gregman. I'm pretty sure I understand the motion and the intent, but can I ask for it to just be uh, read back from Ms. Karmaschewski or Mr. Or Councillor Bressy wants to just say it again, please? Well, you know what, I'll ask Arlene uh, to give it back just so we can make sure she heard what Councillor Bressy said as well, uh, Arlene. Thank you, Mayor Given. I may not have caught the entire motion, but I'll give you what I've, I've captured. So moved by Councillor Bressy, Council Direct Administration to bring forward a public information campaign to inform residents about the appropriate use of face masks on a voluntary basis. Yeah, I think the uh, I think that the the two things that tweak there is instead of face masks, saying face coverings. Okay. People mean different things with masks, and then also uh, face coverings in indoor public spaces. Thank you. There we go. Thanks, Council Pop, for helping us get that clarification. Yeah, thank you. And I guess on that, I, I definitely want to support this. I, some some of the things that have already been said. I think it's really imperative that we do an educational piece. And I do like the, the public uh, getting educated on this and, and us being uh, top of mind for that. So I would support the motion. I think it's a great motion. It's a good start. Uh, maybe more motions will come later, but I think this is a really good starting point uh, in allowing us to have some public engagement. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Plot. Councillor Friesen? Thank you very much. Um, I... Uh, Thank you, Councillor Bressy. I think that education is is key here, and there is a lot of information out there that's uh, really good information, some misunderstanding um, that is easily cleared up, and um, to have as much accurate information as possible out in the community, I think, is really important. Um, one thing that uh, I, I suspect there are a number of people listening, and I... I um, really want to make sure that it's communicated to folks in Grand Prairie as well that um, we absolutely respect no, no no one here wants to you know run roughshod over individual rights in particular those that are protected under Alberta human rights and Canada human rights and those protected grounds include um, protection for individuals who through physical disability mental um, health disability or developmental disability are unable to wear a mask. That's, um, that, that is an absolute, uh, of absolute importance to myself and, and I think to uh, my colleagues as well. So I really do want that communicated. Um, I also very much appreciate the delegation that was here. There are very few um, topics that come to council that land so squarely in my wheelhouse. And um, this is, uh, one that does. Um, there were references made to um, NIOSH and OSHA and some bang on fantastic information that was given in that presentation and, and I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. Um, NIOSH is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health and OSHA is uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Both are U.S. organizations 
Um, NIOSH is actually a department of CDC and OSHA defers to CDC on this matter. So um, the, the, why I'm pointing this out is because those organizations really mandate in the US and Canada takes a great deal from that um, and, and many Canadians are NIOSH and OSHA certified as well, so that's important, but um, they really deal with the protection of workers from inhalants. And with both of those organizations deferring to the CDC on this public health matter, the CDC actually encourages non-medical mask use, which is what uh, Councillor Bressy is getting at as a face covering. And um, you know, if you're going to put that into that hierarchy, uh, it really is up in the hierarchy as sort of um, a, a barrier, a physical barrier, which is an engineering control, and it is a barrier from the droplet uh, getting out. So it's not a protection uh, necessarily from inhalants, which is a lot what our uh, our delegation talked about. And um, I, I just I wanted to make that distinction as part of what's important to us and what we're about to vote on, which is education of the public. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Friesen. Um, sorry, did I have somebody else in my queue? Um, okay. I'll, I'll just say uh, I support the motion. I think that this is a good first step. I've always believed that uh, um, really um, individuals have taken on a significant burden as we've gone into the pandemic. We've all had to change our lives in many, many different ways. Um, and, but we are all part of a society, a collective, where we each take those steps, not just for our own health or for the health of people that we know, but also for the health and safety of other people that we don't know. Um, and I think if we are able to share information about how face coverings can be used effectively as a physical barrier uh, that is basically with you all the time and in settings where you can't be physically separate from people, then, then I, my hope would be that the majority of Grand Prairie residents would make their own voluntary choice to use that physical barrier uh, when it's necessary and, uh, and to help not to eliminate the potential of ever getting coronavirus, um, but to help reduce the spread and slow the spread so that we can protect our healthcare system. You know, that my understanding of all the pandemic measures has been to ensure that the reliability and accessibility of our healthcare system. Um, I don't think that there's anybody from uh, Dr. Hinshaw on down uh, that suggests that we can ever prevent everyone from getting coronavirus. Um, but I think the goal is clear that we want to try to slow down the spread and protect the most vulnerable. Um, and so uh, I think educating the public about the intent of face coverings and their utility um, and cutting through some of the misinformation that is circulating online is a really great first place for us to start. Um, I would be willing to support other measures or at least the the start of, of other discussions around what we might do if we were ever required uh, to institute a, a mandatory approach. Um, I don't believe we're there yet, um, but I would be willing to support some initial steps so that if we get there, we are prepared rather than uh, unprepared. Um, but I'm happy to support Councillor Bressy's motion at this stage. Uh, I didn't see anybody else, and then I would go, I guess, then to Councillor Bressy to close. Yeah, great. Well, I, I appreciate hearing from everybody. I'm glad that it looks like this motion has support and just kind of my pitch for those watching of why I'd love to see voluntary face mask usage increase in our community is I really am persuaded by the medical experts when I'm watching Dr. Hinshaw and other medical experts I'm seeing really, really unanimous consent for the ones that work for the province and work for our country and the ones that I personally find from these beautiful resources say and Masks really do seem to important, important not to stop the wear from getting sick, but to prevent the spread in the community. That being said, I also respect that I, under, well, I understand that some have come to different conclusions about the medical use, but something else I'll say is I've, I'm sure as with the rest of council, I've had many, 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 many conversations about masks over the last few weeks. And what I've heard from a lot of people in our community is they feel so much better as they're seeing mask usage go up. I've had some people tell me that they just feel safer going to the grocery store or going wherever they need to go if they've got masks, often because they've got some sort of medical condition that makes coronavirus especially scary for them or a loved one, so they feel physically safer. I've also heard many of our residents tell me that they feel that masks, they feel, they feel responsibility to wear masks, but they also are very nervous about the negative 
social consequences of people yelling at them or people, people frankly, just bullying them for wearing masks. And those people have told me that as they've seen mask usage go up, it makes them feel a lot better about the choice that they feel responsible to do. So for me, I wear a mask when I'm in stores right now and in public places. And partly that's because I know it really makes people in our community feel better being in our community. I don't think feelings like that are a compelling reason to mandate masks, but I think that feelings are a good reason to voluntarily choose to wear a mask for the sake of making the people around me that belong to my community feel safer. So I really hope that we will see more voluntary usage in Grand Prairie. So I appreciate council, the council's hopeful support of this motion. Okay, thanks Council Rusty for that close. Uh, I think we're all clear on the motion um, and that was a close for our discussion and debate. So I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you, that motion carries unanimously. Um, was there any other business related to our delegations? Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mayor Gavin. Um, again, on the same topic, um, I'm, I'm going to suggest uh, a motion regarding the uh, expiration of the uh, mandatory mask requirement just because uh, it's possible that we'll need it. So I'll, I'll uh, read out this motion and then um, uh, we can get into the discussion. Uh, so I would move that council direct administration to develop for future council consideration a bylaw mandating the use of face coverings in indoor public places that includes recommendations and appropriate public health indicators that may trigger such the, enact, uh, uh, the enactment and removal of such a requirement. Arlene, that's fairly lengthy in wording. If necessary, I can email it to you after the thing. Um, um, and to speak to this, there, there are a couple of points I'd like to make. First, um, Thank you to Councillor Friesen for pointing out that the presentation from Alcan um, really makes the assumption that masks are there for the protection of people who would might be inhaling the virus. Uh, I truly believe that uh, what's being told to us by uh, Dr. Tam, Dr. Hinshaw, uh, the WHO, CDC, in, in all of their most recent um, uh, publications is that um, masks are far more effective in, um, in stopping the dispersal. Uh, from those people who may be uh, in infected without knowing it. And uh, so for the protection of the public, the idea is to have masks on to keep from spreading the virus. Um, but what concerns me is the number of people who don't understand that concept. We've had over 200 emails sent to council from people who it appears don't understand that concept. We all know that it only takes one person to create an outbreak that will affect maybe tens, maybe hundreds of people in the long run. And um, so there's a great risk out there for people misunderstanding and then deciding not to use masks on a voluntary basis. And I, I think we need to be better protected than that. Um, I also think that there is a sense of urgency in all of this, in that it's going, only going to be a couple of more weeks until uh, kids are back in school. They're going to be in classrooms where social distancing is not going to be possible. and. Uh, uh, although it's going to be mandatory for them to wear masks, we also have the risk that there will be contamination from the mishandling of masks. And all we need is for youngsters to come home and um, uh, start to uh, expose other members of their family to, to the virus. Uh, I really think it's very important for us to be ready to mandate mask wearing in uh, public places. And I also think that uh, uh, there's an urgency to it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks. Councillor Blackburn for that motion and that introduction. Uh, open for discussion and debate. 
Yeah, Councillor Clayton. Sorry, I know um, Councillor Blackburn mentioned he was going to email the motion later, but I kind of I would appreciate the motion being read again. I'm not comfortable voting on a on certain motions, so if you could read it again, that'd be appreciated. I'd be happy to do that. Um, I move that council direct administration develop for future council consideration a bylaw mandating use of face coverings in indoor public spaces that includes recommendations of appropriate public health indicators that may trigger the enactment and removal of such a requirement. Okay. Um, so Councilor Clayton, I'll let you consider that before, you know, if you want to come back, we can come back to you uh, now that you've sort of heard it. Uh, I have Councilor Thiessen, then Councilor Friesen, and I'm going to jump in there somewhere uh, as well, and then we can uh, continue on. Councilor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. I think uh, I think I'm, I can support this this uh, direction to administration, uh, largely because uh, as we've seen over the last week and a bit, ever since this letter came out and people started really uh, getting worked up about it, that there is uh, there is concern on both sides of the mass debate uh, uh, as to what we what we might or may not do. Um, and I think it's only appropriate that we have this discussion inside the realm of the public, uh, which is essentially what we're elected to do, um, to take as much information as possible as we can and to come to a decision that hopefully is to the benefit of our entire community. And uh, to have something in place, sorry. Uh, looks like Councillor Thiessen has temporarily left the meeting, um, so we will come back to him for his comments when he's able to rejoin. Councillor Friesen. Thank you, Mayor Given. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn, for this thoughtful um, motion. I will support the motion, and I, um, in in particular, what I like about this motion is. Uh, you stated that there would be a, a trigger point um, for this to happen. In those some 200 emails that we got, I replied to as many as I could, which was about half of them. And to about half of those, I posed the question, um, because in those emails, we often saw that right now we don't have the, um, the case count to warrant it. And I, and I agree with that completely. Um, but we've, what we've seen in the last couple of weeks is that um, we've almost doubled our case count. So if in two weeks um, a shift like that can happen, um, we, we know that if we relax too much and if um, it, when, when children go back to school, um, we may well see an increase in cases as well. So things can turn fairly quickly. And uh, so I put this question to folks um, you know, what if there was a, a trigger point? And um, it's interesting that uh, those who'd written me to us and who were not in favor of mandated masks um, said, yeah, you know what, that's a reasonable consideration. Um, those who wanted mandated masks that I posed that question to said, why wait? But, you know, there's a balance here that, that we need to strike, and that's between um, the, the choice of the individual and, and um, what really amounts to a, a public health um, protection. And uh, that's why I, I really do like what you've suggested here, Councillor Blackburn. And um, I look forward to seeing, uh, I would encourage my colleagues to support this. Um, the, the, it, it's ideal to have it ready so that if um you know if as two weeks into september we see um a spike in cases it can uh, potentially uh, come into play at that point in time so i would encourage you to support this and i do look forward to seeing then what administration comes back with so to those of you who are paying attention online and uh, and who will be talking about it tomorrow as i know you will um, I do understand that this measure does not mean that um, what comes forward will automatically pass. There's further discussion regarding it. So uh, thanks again, Councillor Blackburn. Okay, thanks, uh, Councillor Friesen. Um, I'll just enter, I see Councillor Platt. I'll just enter to say that I, I support the motion on a, on a couple of points. Uh, first, as Councillor Friesen 
reference, this is direction to administration. It's essentially uh, so that we can be prepared. Um, I think of it a lot like having a uh, emergency evacuation plan for a building. Um, you know, it's a it's standard practice to have a, 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 an evacuation plan to make sure everybody knows what that is, uh, to be trained on it um, in case you ever need it. Um, and just because the building next door or down the street is on fire doesn't mean you use your evacuation plan. Uh, you still have one in place. And so I would really see this like that. Uh, there may be other places around the world in our province that um, where they have epidemics that are out of control. Um, I don't at all think that we're there right now, um, but I do think it's really prudent and reasonable for us to have a plan of what we could do. And this is one step that, that we can influence. The other thing that I really appreciate uh, about this direction to administration is that it's explicit in the idea of triggers that would allow, you know, would indicate that we should bring it on, but also that would indicate when we should take it off. I think often uh, when we look at bylaws, we, we, for most of the ones the city has, they're either on and the bylaw applies all the time or they're off and we don't have such a bylaw. Um, it might be worthwhile in this case to um, think of this a little bit differently. If uh, cases are trending the wrong direction, it may be something that we need in place. Um, and if our community does really great, it contains the spread, uh, then it should be something that we could remove. And I would like to see how that would work. I'm not exactly sure how that would look in a bylaw, um, but I would like administration to do that work so we can consider it so we're prepared. Uh, a lot along the line of having that emergency escape plan. Um, a little bit of advanced planning can go a long way. Um, and failure to do that planning ahead of time uh, can lead to really unfortunate consequences. So I appreciate the motion and I'm happy to support it. Uh, Councillor Pilat. Uh, thanks, Megan. I really appreciate this motion as well. Um, at this point, I could not support a mandatory mask, but I think if we're looking at getting ready, as the mayor mentioned by the mayor and some other council members, I'm, I'm fine with us getting ready to show the community that we will be ready. I do really appreciate that we're going to have a mechanism of when it gets activated and when it can get deactivated. That's been my biggest fear with this is that we don't have a mechanism to turn this off and that it just becomes now a debate among councillors and, and our own personal feelings. So I think a policy that we get to debate or a bylaw we get to debate that has an activation clause and a deactivation clause shows our community that we're, we're being diligent on why we're doing this, not just a fear-based decision and not a reactionary thing. I think it would have some to do that we actually have, we've put it out. Um, I'm not, <laughs> when this comes forward, it's still not going to be a, an easy debate, and I'm sure it'll be full of amendments on the, on the bylaw policy that comes forward from administration, but I'm, I'm like all of us, encouraging and looking forward to those debates. Um, so I appreciate the, the intent here, Councillor Blackburn. I know this is something passionate for you, and, and I appreciate you brought it up, and I will support it because of the uh, the options for us to activate and deactivate this. Okay, thanks, Council Plot. Council Clayton. Thanks, Mayor Given. Um, I'm curious, maybe uh, CAO Galante can confirm uh, when do we expect to see this back? Sure. So the the motion isn't specific to a time, but uh, so that gives them a little bit of leeway, <laughs> uh, Mr. Galante. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, well, we have been doing some research. Um, in, inside of uh, the, uh, the global situation over the last few weeks. So we have some uh, research and background um, documentation already. So uh, we will need probably a couple of weeks at least to uh, put together a, a draft um, a legislation with the appropriate triggers. We will need to connect with Alberta Health Services. Um, I will be looking for Alberta Health Services advice on what would be the, the trigger or triggers uh, in order to enact the, the bylaw or to switch between on and off mode for the bylaw. So there will be some meetings with the World Health Services. So I would say um, give us at least two or three weeks um, to have this, to probably not the next council meeting, but the, the following one, we can bring this to your, uh, for your consideration. Okay, thanks, Mr. Galante. Um, I think I see Councillor Bressy and then Councillor Tool. did I see your hand as well? Yeah, okay, Councillor Bressy, Councillor O'Toole. Thank you, thank you, Mary Given. I might have a, I'm gonna have a, a question for our CAO and it might lead to a motion for an amend amendment. So why don't you let Councillor O'Toole get in before I potentially change the topic a little bit. Sure, Councillor O'Toole. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. I, uh, I will support uh, the motion that Mr. Blackburn had mentioned. Um, and I also agree with the statements that you were making as well. I'm not in support of a mandating a masking, but there may be a time when we do have to do something. 
and the way it's worded and uh, the way it's coming across, I totally support that. I don't, you know, and uh, so th there you go. There's my two cents. Uh, uh, there's a, this is a very top, a controversial subject. I know I've talked to many people on the phone and many people mask to mask, let's just say, and uh, they have concerns about being, you know, their human rights and all that. But in the end, uh, they're saying we're going above our pay scale and making decisions. Uh, we're not implementing anything right now, but if the future does show up, this is an emergency plan, and that's the part I like about it. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor O'Toole. Um, I didn't see anybody else on that point, but Councillor Bessie, you said you had a question. Yeah, well, first of all, let me share how I, where I'm at with it, and then I'll ask my question. Ask my question, and kind of where I'm at with this is definitely support this work being done by administration, which isn't the same as saying I'll support a bylaw when it comes to us. And I know there's a lot of people that are going to go, well, you shouldn't even start creating a bylaw. I think to that, I'd say that we've got a responsibility to be responsive to what we're hearing from residents of this community, and there's a lot of residents who are saying they want a mandatory mask bylaw. There's polling, show, polling shows about half a, a slight majority of Albertans support mandatory masks. I know anecdotally, every time I have a conversation with a resident these days, I'm saying, hey, what do you think about mandatory masks? And I've seen a slight majority there tell me that they'd like a mandatory masking bylaw. I'll also point out that we had a lot of emails, and there were a lot of forum emails that said no to masks, but of the emails where somebody actually wrote some personal thoughts, uh, they, those were about 50-52 of people saying, no, we oppose and we want mandatory masks. And when we've got so many residents saying they want this, I think it would be a real shame if council never even got to a point of debating this and voting, a, voting, and, voting and getting our thoughts on record of what we support or not. So I think that I know there's some who are saying, listen to our residents and don't even talk about this, but I'd say, well, because we're listening to our residents, we've got a responsibility to get this to council for a fulsome discussion, uh, discussion. So I will be supporting this motion, even though I don't know if I'll support a bylaw when it does come to council. Um, that being said, my question for our CAO is, I know a concern I've heard from a lot of people is the legalities of a mandatory face, face covering bylaw. And do we have the constitutional right to do that? Is the city getting pursued? Is it enforceable? I'm kind of curious in terms of getting a legal opinion is if council wants to get a legal opinion, is that something that would be within the realm of possibility to get done without slowing down the timelines here? Or has there already been outside legal advice sought? Or just tell me about what it takes to get a legal opinion on this. Sure, so I'll go first to the city manager and then I see we're uh, joined by Director of Community and Protective Services. So uh, uh, I'll go first to the CEO and then if he wants to pass it on, he can. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mayor Gibbon. Well, first of all, I'm going to say this is uncharted territory for everybody around the world. So as you know, many jurisdictions have enacted already um, mandatory face covering. Uh, here in the province, uh, you have City of Calgary, City of Edmonton, uh, other municipalities are working right now considering the enactment of a bylaw in the, in the near future, thinking about the, the triggers, talking about the combination of factors, what would be the best approach. So I can say there is no case law right now um, because this is a new uh, topic uh, around the world. Um, of course, as Councillor Friesen mentioned um, a few minutes ago, there are exemptions based on a variety of factors uh, for you know, medical issues or people with disabilities, et cetera that will be considered in a, in a, in a form of bylaw as well. Um, and can be an enforcement piece, which could be uh, softer or stronger. Um, you know, that will be a matter of, of conversation. So there's no precedent. If, if this is challenged in a, in a, in a court, um, there are no rulings yet, this is, this is new. So um, we, can, we can for sure seek some legal, legal opinion um, in our um, legal counsel, but uh, just, just keep in mind that the uh, novelty of, of this matter around the world, not, not only here. So with, with that caveat, we will we'll, we'll connect with our uh, legal team for some, uh, some opinions about that. Thank you. And do you, need, do you require a motion of counsel to do that, or is that something you just do if this motion passes? 
Yeah, no, no, we will we'll, we'll take care of that. Don't worry. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Manuel, I don't know if you had anything else uh, to contribute on that. Yeah, maybe one thing I'll add is our bylaw making authorities come from the Municipal Government Act. Section 8 of the, sorry, Section 7 of the Municipal Government Act outlines uh, what we can use those authorities for. And the very first one is the safety, health, and welfare of people and the protection of people and property. So um, that's cited basically in any bylaw we use to regulate people's behavior. And uh, this would be one of the sections referenced in regard to creating a bylaw around face coverings. Um, so it's not unprecedented. Uh, you know, frankly, we tell people they have to wear clothes in public. We tell people they have to do a, an assortment of things. So we're not really pushing the limits here. And the Charter of Freedoms and Rights, which is quoted quite frequently by people opposed to face coverings, the overall premise of it is it has to be for the public good. So any right can be infringed upon under the Charter of Freedoms and Rights if it's for the public good. So that's kind of the basis behind a lot of these, um, these bylaws. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Director Manuel. And obviously, uh, should Council choose to pass this motion, um, when administration finally comes forward with bylaw for consideration, that would be a point where Council would be able to look at all these uh, more technical details, I guess, of, of you know the ability of the city to do something like this, uh, the practicality of any of the measures and any of the other items. So thanks for that. Um, okay, so is there any other discussion or debate on Councillor Blackburn's motion? I don't see any. Um, then I will call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Um, and so that uh, deals with, I believe, our uh, delegation with respect to uh, face coverings and uh, the United Nurses of Alberta letter. Um, we did also have a presentation uh, with respect to uh, the naturalization issue from Mr. Sims and uh, Ms. Bruce, who had intended to present on that. Do we have anything arising on that? Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you, Mayor Given. Um, I've got I've got two motions I'm going to try out try out unless somebody beats me or somebody else wants to make motions. But one is I've got two concerns. One is naturalization in general across the city, and one is the very specific case of this ravine. And I don't know if and they're connected, but I but maybe Council's got interest in looking at one and not the other. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a motion that uh, I'd move that Council direct administration administration to bring in a, a report to the appropriate standing committee meeting on the status of naturalization across the city, including how sites are selected. And just to speak to speak to this, uh, I, I'll bring council back to our last budget deliberations where we reduced the uh, amount of mowing we do in parks. And I went back and watched the video after meeting with residents of Mission Heights. And something that was said in that meeting was, you know, we don't really know what kind of impact this is gonna be in the community, whether it's desirable or not. And it's something that we need to keep an eye on and go back and revisit and revisit in budget deliberations. And I think that I really do think that that's still true that we should be taking a look at the impact of what we're doing and saying, do we support this or do we not? And so I'd like to know a little bit more about what's going on with naturalization, but mostly I've got an understanding of it in principle, but I've got to admit I'm I've been surprised by where it's happening. So. I went and had this conversation with these residents seeing their ravine where I really got what they were saying in terms of this has a big impact on us. And then as I was driving home, I was driving down the bypass, watching a big shoulder that nobody ever walks along that is far away from houses getting mowed. And I've got to admit that really surprised me because when we talk naturalization, I kind of, I assumed and maybe wrongly that the areas we'd start would be those road boulevards. And so even though I understand the benefits of naturalization, I don't, I don't understand why we're doing it in the way we are in the city right now. And I'm sure there's very good reasons. I've got to know our administration well enough that, I, that they've always got good reasons when I'm surprised by things. But I'd like to know what those are, are more. So I hope that council will support this motion to bring back a report on the status of naturalization, including how sites were selected. Okay, thanks, Councillor Bressy. Uh, so basically a, a direction for administration to bring forward that report so council can be more informed. And obviously that would be a public report that would be able to be shared uh, out to members of the public as well. Any discussion or debate on Councillor Bressy's motion? 
Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you, that motion carries unanimously. Uh, was there any other business arising on that matter? Council Bressing? Yeah, and then I'd like to try another one, another one too, and that is I'd like to move that council direct administration um, to bring forward to bring forward to the appropriate standing committee uh, opportun opportunities to still provide gathering spaces in the ravine and Mission Heights. And I'm open to wordsmithing there, but basically what that is is, so I went and met with these residents. It wasn't just the two that that came here. So I was, it was Friday on a long weekend. It was about 4.30 and I thought I was having a meeting with one resident. And then on a Friday on a long weekend, about 20 residents showed up. And I know if it was Friday evening on a long weekend, a lot more probably would have shown up if they weren't already out of town. And so this is something that really is of a high interest to those neighbors. And I think when you talk about aesthetics, when you talk about fire breaks, when you talk, when you talk about, um, when you talk about those types of things, I'll, I'll trust, I'll trust our staff on the technical side of things, but when, I, when I'm hearing about the impact on neighbor neighborhood, only the neighbors can tell you that. And really what bugged me was I heard stories about barbecues that happened every year down in that ravine that brought neighbors together. I heard the stories about kids learning how to bike and tobogganing down the hills. And I think it's a real shame that, they're, that they've lost some of those opportunities for community gatherings. And I'd like to have confidence that they're going to have those opportunities back. I don't think the whole ravine needs to be mowed, but I definitely think that I'd like to see parts. I'd like to see parts of it mowed, and I'd love to make sure that administration connecting with these neighbors and then circling back to us. Okay, uh, so there's a second motion there. Councilor Bressy sort of indicated uh, that he's uh, would be happy to do any uh, massaging of the motion. Um, is there any discussion or debate on it or feedback for Councilor Bressy? Um, Councilor Clayton. Thanks, Mary Gibbon. Uh, so Councilor Bressy, walk me through this again. You want to see a map where established gathering, gathering spaces are currently and what the opportunities are for new ones. Is that correct? Well, not necessarily new ones, but what I heard from these neighbors is that it was important to be able to walk through the ravine. It was important to be able to have a barbecue in the ravine. It was important for our kids to be able to, to toboggan in the ravine, which doesn't, which I think are activities that are worthwhile protecting which also don't mean that the whole ravine needs to be mowed. It certainly doesn't need to be remote, mowed six or seven times per year. So I'd love to hear, I'd love to make sure that administration's talking to those neighbors and hearing what their needs and their hopes with the area are and seeing if there's opportunities to provide those for these residents without, without completely backtracking on naturalizing the whole area. I think that there's areas of it that could be mowed and meet the needs of these neighbors while still naturalizing a great deal of land. Uh, I see you, Councillor Plot, Councillor Friesen. Um, so I'll just say uh, before before going to you. Uh, so um, I was happy to support the first motion. I think, Councillor Bressy, I'm not going to support this motion um, because I think the the report that will come will naturally lead to some of this discussion that would enable me to understand the idea of natural of naturalization better. Um, and then I would be in a position to decide whether the merits, you know, that 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 are presented to us. Are things that I'd be willing to trade off, or if there are other ways to solve the the gathering issue. Um, so yeah, so I, I I think that that'll be a natural trigger for us to have a discussion about the desires of the mission neighborhood, um, and just with the 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 direction in this motion isn't isn't quite there. I, and I appreciate that you're struggling with that, how to phrase it, um, but I think we will naturally get there when the report comes. Council will see that, consider it. Um, and, and in any case, I think we're going to be through one season shortly, uh, you know, and that will give us all an opportunity, including the neighbors, to say, so what worked about that? What didn't work? What could we do differently? And those would be natural opportunities to think about next season. Um, so uh, so I, I'm, I'm, uh, I think we'll have more chances to address the concerns of the neighborhood naturally because as a result of your first motion. Um, and so I'm comfortable with, with dealing with them as that comes up. Uh, Councillor Plott, then Councillor Friesen. Uh, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. I'm, I'm in line with uh, Mayor Gibbon on this one. I don't think, uh, I think that first report will get to this. I also liked uh, Councillor Friesen's question earlier. Um, maybe, maybe it's not exactly what she was thinking, but I think in the Pinnacle Ridge Fountain where this community has a feature that they're paying a special levy for. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of curious with conversations how they go on that. It's horrible to think that the, that the community would have to pay for a special feature, but at the end of the day, 
us increasing costs around the city to more ravine that only impacts one community isn't necessarily fair to the whole community. So I, I like to see this report come from administration to have some conversations about that and then start looking at alternatives of maybe there's areas that we do need to mow more and see if that community is an interest and if they're interested in it, maybe it's a $30 a year levy for that area only and it supports mowing extra things in that area. But the, the mowing in the ravine at Mission doesn't help somebody in through many other and I think that was the intention was to help with taxes, but also to, to see how it worked for the first year. So I think we let it run for the first year. Um, I think administration's got a lot on their plate already with the first report and other things that we've had on today. So, so I wouldn't be supporting this portion today. I'd like to look for alternative ways of funding those things if they actually decided that they wanted to come forward in the future. Okay, thanks, Councillor Plot. I've got Councillor Friesen and Councillor O'Toole. Thanks. Um, I, I was going to say the same thing. I think it's a little... Uh, premature to um, send administration out to gather this information based on assumptions made because of the experience in one community. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the information that's brought back from your first recommendation or your first motion, uh, Councillor Bressy. And I, I appreciate that one because I, I think you're right in, in that we need to kind of step back a little bit and, um, and see what the impacts have been. But like Mayor Given said, we've kind of now, we're sort of toward the end of the season and we'll have the winter to do some engagement to uh, make the adjustments we may need to make for next year. And, you know, the, one of the adjustments we may make is that, um, you know, it's actually worth it for the overall health of the communities in our city to, um, to unnaturalize some of the areas that we thought we should naturalize and, um, and perhaps there are some other boulevards that we can allow to grow up or whatever. So yeah, it's just a, a good time to have a fulsome review of, of what we decided last year. Um, this is a bit, uh, a bit premature and narrow for right now in my opinion, thanks. Okay, so I had a few others. I have Councillor O'Toole, then Councillor Blackburn and Councillor Clayton. So thank you very much, Mayor Given. Uh, I will not be supporting this motion. I think Councillor Bressy is about six months premature on uh, on this. I think you should write that motion down and see what happens next year. And uh, we may be able to use it and support it. But uh, at this time, unlike the rest of everybody that commented, I think uh, we need to analyze things first. And uh, we haven't given that any thought yet at all. So uh, I will not be supporting this motion. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor O'Toole, Councillor Blackburn, then Councillor Clayton. Thank you, Mayor Given. I'm going to support this motion, and here's why. The, I, I did receive some correspondence regarding this as well, and uh, with all due respect for the work that was done by administration in deciding um, to take the action that has been taken, there was no consultation with residents. And suddenly something that these people have been able to enjoy uh, from the tax dollars that they pay to our city um, it has been taken away from them um, for a reason that is not really all that apparent to them, although it may be apparent to some of our administration people. Um, I just think that we need to turn this around and I think taking it one step at a time um, uh, means that this this particular neighborhood who has uh, taken the initiative to come forward and say, hey, we think we've been wronged here, we ought to turn around and fix it. And we can talk about the other areas that people have not yet complained about um, uh, as a result of uh, the report that will come from the first motion. But um, I'm, I'm for fixing what we uh, in their eyes, have done wrong. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Councillor Blackburn. Councillor Clayton? Thanks, Mayor Given. Um, I won't be supporting the motion as uh, was identified to Council at the beginning of this uh, growing season, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this was a project in regards to what us to see the opportunities are for naturalized space. And so much like we went through a process of snow removal and had learning experiences, um, of what works and what doesn't work. In my opinion, this naturalized space will be a learning experience from the first season 
administration clearly identified from the beginning that you know this was an opportunity for us to save money but also an opportunity for us to um, naturalize for the benefits of naturalization so I think I'm, I'm fully expecting that administration will bring back information and with the previous motion we will see other information that will be beneficial to what our decisions are making for next year so um, I look forward to the report I think that definitely there I agree with Councillor Blackburn in the sense that there potentially wasn't enough public consultation in what people are using certain open spaces for. And, and, and in that point, I don't know if as an operational facility we would ever know somebody uses that part of the park and somebody uses that part of an open space and nobody uses that one. And so as we learn over this season, um, I encourage public to continually send forward information of, you know, hey, I, I always used to throw Frisbee with, with my kids in that spot but now I can't because we'll never know if you don't let us know. So, you know, there definitely are parts in the community that probably can be naturalized that we didn't even identify this year and we're still mowing because we just assume they should be mowed. So I look forward to see, you know, what the report comes back at the end of this season. We can assess it. Um, the department will have feedback. Hopefully we get more public feedback um, between now and, and the decisions of next year. And then with the previous motion, there will be additional information. And in my opinion, that'll be, you know, enough sort of, buckets of information that we should be able to make a better decision next year if we choose to go down this process of naturalization again and find cost savings and and maybe then through that we found spaces that you know were utilized better and and you know it's sort of the sort of if you always throw a frisbee with your kid in the same spot every year and you have to move a little bit maybe you realize you liked that other space better you just weren't forced to move before so you know we just sort of have to adapt to it and I think that um, administration will bring us the necessary information so I appreciate your intent council Bresci. I just don't know if it's necessary to make a separate work project for this sort of piece of information thanks okay thanks councillor Clayton I think we've had just about everybody um, and so um, then we'll go to councillor Bresci to close on his motion councillor Bresci thank you yeah I'd really encourage council to pass this motion and I really do hear a lot of what what's being said in terms of maybe it feels a little bit premature. I mean, there's, it was really intentional that I made that other motion first because I do agree that in general, I want us to take that very high level, high level view and then not delve into these specific neighborhood by neighborhood once or and certainly not dive into these before we take that high level view. At the same time here for me, the timing just doesn't work out. And to be really blunt, I really want those families to be able to go to bargaining this winter. And I'm scared that if we wait a few months to get into the winter to get a report on naturalization, we've lost the opportunity to mow at Toboggan Hill and they're losing an entire winter of tobogganing on those hills is what I'm scared of. And that really bugs me for two reasons. Number one, the hills there, they're the type where you really got four to five years of the kid's life where they're the right size hills for them. It's a real shame. I know there's young families there that specifically bought because of the hill, because of the hill, because of the ravine. It's a real shame if we take away one of the four or five really great winters they get, and then we end up mowing them anyways in the future. And so I think it's appropriate to say, hey, we're going to do a bit of mowing while we figure it out here, I think is, appro is appropriate. And I think it's especially important this year where it's who knows if kids are going to be in, frankly, who knows if kids are going to be in school in the winter. And even if kids are in school, it's not exactly the world it was last year where you can have your friends over inside to play. We're looking for more opportunities for people to get outside. And I don't think this is the year to be saying to families, sorry, we're going to take away your toboggan hill and not mow your toboggan hill and see how it goes. So I really think that this is one of those cases where we should be making sure that at least the toboggan hill in this neighborhood is maintained while we're figuring out what we do with the space in the long term. So council will pass this motion. Okay, thanks for that close, Councillor Bressy. Uh, I'll call for vote on Councillor Bressy's motion. Uh, all those in favor? Okay, thank you. Three in favor and opposed. Thank you. That's the balance opposed. Uh, that motion does not carry. So I, th I think we've dealt with uh, our two types of delegation business, uh, unless there's anything else arising. Uh, and it looks like there is none. Then we will uh, go into council member reports, uh, starting first with um, updates from our external agencies, boards, and commissions. And I think we maybe only have one. Councillor O'Toole, you said you had something with respect to the Combative Sports Commission. Yes, Mayor Given, I got an invite to participate in a uh, virtual meeting 
and the, uh, the chair of the meeting was John Barber from Edmonton Sports Council. And uh, the person that was involved that brought this meeting to make happen was uh, Leah Sharon Ahur, the Minister of Culture, Multiculturalism, and Status of Women. And she wanted to know the, the concerns of the combative sports industry in Alberta. So I think there were 16 representatives from the different uh, commissions. And uh, to be honest with you, she didn't give any advice. She was there just to listen. I, she never even spoke, really. She just introduced herself. And she just laid back and listened to what the, counts, uh, the commissions had to say. Uh, and some of the con uh, concerns that I brought up were uh, what is the uh, – what is the, the, the go-ahead process? And uh, there was no answers. Uh, everything has to go through Alberta Health Services. And so uh, we went through 16 commissions with a number of questions. And uh, what's going to happen is some of the commissions are going to meet again and try and come up with a game plan on how to pursue, uh, when to pursue, and what's all involved in pursuing the opening of the combative sports again in this province. So it's a very blank slate at the beginning. There was not a lot of serious discussion other than we've got athletes that aren't being able to uh, fight or train, and we've got gyms that have been closed for a long time, and now it's getting back into that position. There's literally millions of dollars being lost in this industry, and uh, but... I just said I don't want to start anything unless it's done safe and we need to have some guidelines and uh, somebody's got to create those guidelines. So it looks like the commissions themselves are going to work with Alberta Health Services to design a set of guidelines for the reopening of the combative sports. And that's my report. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Toole. Um, were there any other updates from the external agencies, boards, commissions? I don't think there were, but I'd just make sure if there's somebody that I missed. Uh, and it looks like maybe not. Uh, so then we'll go to council member roundtable. Um, and it's always, uh, you know, I'll go with <laughs> sort of a little bit like a bingo thing. You know, you circulate on my screen. And so I know I'm not always starting the same spot. Councillor Plot, you're on the bottom right of my screen. Uh, so you're first today. All right. Bingo. Uh, so it was good to have council break. It's nice to be back and uh, seeing everybody's faces here again. Um, for me, our, our family got away to Calgary and uh, kind of asked us for a little trip. So it was nice to actually go down and be part of a mask wearing community and just hearing the comments and conversations. I took an opportunity to walk through them all just to see what was going on, had chats with just random people, which was easier in another city sometimes. But um, it was a great break to get away, but it was interesting just um, seeing and hearing firsthand some of the impacts of, of masks. And so it was, it was nice to be in Calgary at a time of that. So it's probably uh, helped me make a decision better moving forward, in my, in my own opinion, anyways. Uh, another than that, it was just it was a nice break, but looking forward to a busy week here back with Council hitting Pulse again. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Plot. Uh, Councillor Thiessen. All right. Uh, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Uh, I know it looks like I just uh, got back from Combative Sports Commission event. Uh, but uh, there's a reason for this. There's a little knock off my bucket list. I enjoyed my uh, council vacation as well. And uh, unfortunately, I took a shot to the head by a famous political figure, Louis Riel. He was a statue. I was climbing up on him. I had a hat, couldn't see it, busted my nose open. That's how it goes. But it was good because I got that off my bucket list. But besides that, uh, I did want to uh, just... Uh, talk about uh, something that's happening this weekend as uh, we were all on break and there wasn't much for events going on. But uh, if you are unaware, uh, this weekend is the Unfestival for the Bear Creek Folk Music Festival. It's August 15th at 7 p.m. I was talking with the promoter, Sarah Card, earlier today, after, right after I got off the phone with Mayor Given, and uh, she was telling me all about the special surprises, the good acts, the behind-the-scenes footage that's going to be on there and some advertisements for our fair city as well. So um, I would encourage uh, council or any member of our community, if you have the time, it's a three and a half hour show this Saturday, starting at seven o'clock. Uh, for once I'm praying for wind and rain so that they get a good attendance. Uh, it's 
kind of opposite to what you normally pray for for good attendance at a festival. But it's a non festival, and I would encourage everyone to get out there as soon as possible. And finally, uh, I've been doing this thing on Facebook uh, for uh, the Grand Prairie Regional Hospital foundation and trying to raise money for panda warmers in the backyard burger picture showdown of which i'm one of the celebrity judges i'm gonna challenge mayor given to make a burger in his backyard take a picture and send it in uh and maybe you can add burger king to your resume along with mayor and other future political aspirations anyways that's all i got thank you bill you've been challenged i'm uh, next on the list Thanks, Councilor Thiessen. Uh, if you would have let me know in between the council break, I could have had this mission accomplished already because I did cook a backyard burger in that one hour slot that we had. Um, next, I guess, is uh, Councilor Blackburn. Looks like he's froze. No, I, sorry, Councilor Blackburn, did you catch that I uh, picked you as next? Sorry, it, it might have been uh, my connection uh, just as you said the name is frozen i didn't know it was me uh, and after all that i have nothing to report thank you thanks councillor blackburn councillor friesen thank you i've actually got um a couple of things that i got to go to this week that were pretty exciting i did go to the uh so heritage day spent some time down at the park with my dear little mother that I got to introduce to counselors Bresby and O'Toole who were also at the event. But we attended the opening of the uh, exhibit at the, mu the museum, uh, the Tazer Caboose. So I'm gonna leave that for one of the others, perhaps Councillor O'Toole who gave greetings uh, um, might wanna speak more to it. But the other thing I wanna talk about, we've heard a lot about um, the hardship on the, this pandemic been on Grand Prairie businesses and uh, I do know of a couple that um, have not been able to weather the uh, the times that we've been in and that's pretty heartbreaking. But I got to uh, attend a grand opening of a new business in uh, in the city the other day and uh, it's um, <clears throat> Melissa St. Pierre has had Pierre and Co in the in the city for a couple of years but has not had bricks and mortar but she has now opened Petals and Posies uh, over on um, 100th, I guess it's 99th Street, um, heading uh, heading east from downtown. And uh, I went there to, uh, there was a, a lovely crowd um, who were social distancing and or wearing masks, which was nice to see. Um, but it just is really encouraging to know that there are some uh, businesses uh, getting starts as well as, uh, you know, even though where we have, um, you know, really hurt for those that aren't doing well. Um, so Petals and Posies, check it out. And uh, uh, Melissa actually has a subscription. So folks who have a significant other or maybe, um, a, a, you know, a mom that you'd like to send monthly flowers to, you can do their subscription and they just get automatically sent monthly. So some of you might take advantage of that. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Friesen. Councillor O'Toole. Thank you much, Mary, uh, Mayor Given. Uh, yes, on Heritage Day, I was down at the uh, museum and Charles was unveiling the uh, Prevay Caboose. Uh, Paul Prevere was a local photographer, and Paulette, his twin sister, uh, was the one that uh, spoke on behalf of the family, and it was Paulette and Paul's father that uh, brought this caboose from uh, one part of Alberta to Grand Prairie. They actually had to go back a second time to, uh, to uh, bring more stuff back in this caboose. So anyhow, it's been completely restored, and uh, there's pictures of along the, the trail where they had uh, stops and uh, took pictures. The Prevere family were very avid photographers going back many generations. Uh, so the next event that I went to was uh, the uh, Habitat for Humanity in the Rotary House. Uh, it was just the day before I took my granddaughter on a bike ride and we drove by those houses. And uh, she says, 
that's pretty interesting. Those houses are all the same. And I says, I don't know what they are. Turns out the next day I'm there and it's, uh, it's a Habitat for uh, Humanity uh, house. And I think there's eight of them being built. And the city had uh, a big portion to do with that. Uh, we donated some land to that. So uh, I think that's how the story goes. And uh, in the end, it was uh, well received. And uh, we got to hear some very touching stories uh, from the, both the director of Habitat for Humanity and, uh, and, a, and a resident that what took, was able to qualify. So uh, that was what I did last week. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Tool. Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you. Well, I'm going to add color commentary to two events. And one was at the Habitat Humanity event, I ended up talking to the fund, the fund development officer for Habitat Edmonton. And something that was shared with me was our Rotary Club of Grand Prairie gave the biggest single gift that Habitat Edmonton has ever received. So they gave $980,000, which came from the good people of Grand Prairie buying their dream home tickets and many more volunteering to sell those dream home tickets or to help get that home built or whatever. So our dream home and our Rotary Club and our, and our residents and the residents of other municipalities in our region really came together and did something special, giving those eight families and many more in the future living a uh, uh, place to get started on home ownership. But how cool is that? Grand Prairie is the biggest gift in Habitat in history. That's neat. We, we punch above our weight when it comes to charitable giving in Grand Prairie. And if we can beat Edmonton for the biggest gift ever, I think that just proves how much we punch above our weight. Uh, the other thing that was interesting for me was as after the caboose unveiling, I managed to finagle my way into a tour of the back areas of the museum. And I've never been outside the public areas before. I don't know who else has been in the back areas, but I never had. And it was really interesting seeing how crowded the space is back there. It was really interesting seeing how much space is completely empty right now because the sprinklers there just aren't, there's issues with the sprinklers there. And it really made me feel feel right that we've got capital dollars set aside to help give give people there a place to work, but also protect protect the valuable things that that museum works with that are so valuable to our heritage, and also to put on great public programming for our kids and other residents. And so it was great to see that and see that our capital budget in that area is going to go to well to great use. Thanks, Councillor Bressy. Um, I will uh, just say that I also attended the Habitat for Humanity unveiling. It was a real pleasure to speak on behalf of uh, all of you and on behalf of the city. Um, while I was there, I made I was very intentional about uh, acknowledging our city staff. Um, I think the city of Grand Prairie has been involved in uh, every Habitat for Humanity build in our community, um, uh, most often finding land, uh, but we've also been involved in uh, identifying um, uh, old homes that had foundations that could be reused and repurposed and, and donating those to the effort. In this case, the city uh, purchased all the land uh, using some affordable housing dollars that we had. Um, and we are also uh, a part of the Habitat effort by sec helping secure the site where, for the Habitat for Humanity resource. And none of those things happened because of uh, simply the will of city council. Here. Uh, we've had a lot of city administration who have been ready to work over time on, uh, on such a good community initiative. And so it, just, it was a real pleasure to acknowledge our city staff um, who um, both Habitat and the Rotary Club were also made an effort to mention uh, the support of city staff in, in getting that going, which I really appreciated hearing. Um, I also attended uh, and represented the city at uh, the Spring Municipal Leaders Caucus uh, last uh, week before last, which was in uh, Fairview. Um, the Rotary President, Barry Marchita, is traveling the province, um, still doing in-person events, um, but bringing them out across the province for municipal leaders to come and hear about the activities of AUMA. And then the next day, uh, I joined him on his summer tour in our region and uh, went with him and uh, another AUMA board member to visit the town of Sexsmith, the village of Hythe, and the uh, town of Wembley. And so uh, it was great to get to show up and hear a little bit about our nature, uh, neighbors, uh, get to hear uh, them brag up our region and their communities uh, to President Barry. Um, and I had to remind everybody that I was there as an AUMA board member, not a city, uh, not the mayor of the city. It never works. You can't sort of separate them. Um, but it was really great uh, to get out and see some of the fantastic things that are going on in the other communities in our region. 
Um, and uh, with that, I have nothing else to report. And so I think we can call our meeting adjourned. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a great night. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll see you soon, everyone. Have see you sooner, Bill. Hey, everybody, thanks for Au revoir.